this evening let's continue with the counseling theories we are going to look at some definitions as pertaining to counseling theories one of the definitions was defined by Carl Rogers and Carl Rogers defined the counseling as a process of direct contacts with the individuals that aim to offer assistance in changing attitudes and behaviors. The second definition was by Buck, and Buck defined the counseling as the artificial application of scientifically derived physiological knowledge and the techniques to change human behavior. Then the third definition was by Shastram. Shastram and the Bremer, they defined the counseling as a purposeful reciprocal relationship between two people in which a trained person helps the other to change themselves or their environment. Then the fourth, four variables, four variables determine the amount of growth and the change that take place in any type of counseling. And these four variables are, one, the counselor, second variable is the client setting and theoretical orientation. Let's look at theoretical orientation. Theoretical orientation is an essential part of the effective counseling practice. And there are theories that help counselors to organize clinical data, make up complex processes coherent, and also provide conceptual guidance for interventions. Let's move on to guidance. Guidance helps people make important choices that affect their lives, such as choosing a preferred lifestyle. If individuals want to choose a preferred lifestyle, for example, if they were smokers and they wanted to quit smoking, a counselor would be of good help for this part. Guidance centers on helping individuals choose what they value most, whereas counseling helps them to change. Guidance is part of the service that professional counselors provide to their clients or patients. Let's look at psychotherapy. Psychother psychotherapy focuses on serious problems associated with the intrapsych, meaning the mind, internal and other personal issues and conflicts. Psychotherapy especially analytically is based on therapy and it has been emphasized on has it been emphasized more on the past more than the present, in other words, it emphasizes more on past experiences than the present. Psychotherapy also emphasizes on the inside more than the change. Psychotherapy also emphasizes on the detachment of the therapist and also the therapist's role as an expert. Counseling involves, let's look at what counseling involves. Counseling involves two people, and these two people, these two people interact. A generic term for the exchange of meanings between people. The interaction is highly confidential and highly private and unobservable by, other, by others. 
and the mode of interaction is usually limited to verbal rim or verbal communications. The interaction in counseling usually is prolonged and since alteration of behavior makes time, so this makes the interaction quite prolonged. Counseling involves two individuals, that is one seeking the help and the other a professional trained person who can help the first. There should be a relationship of mutual respect between the two individuals. So counseling is aimed at bringing about desired changes in the individual for self-realization and also providing assistance to solve problems through an intimate personal relationship. Counseling deals with wellness, personal growth, career, education, and the empowerment concerns. Let's look at the effectiveness of counseling. The effectiveness of counseling depends on numerous variables. The first variable is the personality or the background of the counselor. The second one is the formal education of the counselor. The third one is the ability of the counselor to engage in professional counseling related activities. Let's look at the curiosity and inquisitiveness. Curiosity and inquisitiveness, these are values that are necessary for most counselors and it enables them to have a natural interest in people. If a counselor does not have natural interest in people, it means that that particular counselor may not be able to make a good counselor. Because if he doesn't like the people, then it becomes quite difficult for him or her to be a good counselor. A counselor must have ability to listen. Ability to listen, the counselor should be an active listener and should make the client feel heard. In other words, the counselor must listen actively to what the client is saying and the need be, the counselor should also paraphrase some of the words the client is saying. This means that the counselor is actively listening to the client. The other element is comfort, comfort with the conversation. The counselor should be able to display a level of comfort in their voice and the conversations that motivate the clients to open up and share their problems. In other words, the, the counselor should feel comfortable or should have comfort when he is communicating with the client, the counselor should not be in a state of anxiety whereby he is also fearing the client. Empathy and understanding. This is the ability to put oneself into another's place, even if that person is totally different from you. If you have empathy, for the client, if the counselor has empathy for the client, then it means that the client will be able to tell the counselor whatever problems they are going through. But if the counselor does not have empathy, that element of empathy for the client, then it means that the client will not disclose to the counselor whatever problems they are going through. Let's look at emotional insightfulness. Emotional insightfulness, the counselor should be comfortable dealing with a wide range of feelings as pertaining to clients. You know, usually the counselor deals with the different clients. For example, there are those clients who have been raped 
or there are those clients who have been tortured. So the counselor should have should be comfortable dealing with a with a wide range of clients because at times most of the clients will be narrating their stories when they are crying. Some of the clients may also show their emotions. So the counselor is supposed to be comfortable when dealing with the clients. Introception, introception, this is the ability to see or feel from within. What does it mean? It means that the counselor should have the ability to foresee, to foresee or to foresee what the client is going through. These qualities are something that should something that they should have themselves as this can improve the quality of sessions and their thoughts on how to proceed with the same. Let's look at attribution modules of counseling. Attribution refers to what the client attributes the cause of a client's problem to. And there are four attribution modules that are used by counselors. The first one is the medical module, and the medical module doesn't hold the client responsible for their problems, cause, or solution. Then the second one is the moral module. The moral module is the opposite of the medical module. Then the third one is the compensatory module. The compensatory module holds the client responsible for solving their problems, but not for causing them. Then the fourth module is the enlightenment module. The enlightenment module holds the client responsible for causing their problems, but not for solving them. Let's look at the five stages of the counseling process. The five stages of counseling are initial, include initial disclosure, in-depth exploration, goal setting, intervention, evaluation, termination, and referral. In the initial disclosure stage, the main focus is on relationship building, which is based on trust, respect, and the care. The practical tips for building a relationship include one, the counselor should introduce himself or herself to the client. The counselor should also be hospitable, hospitable, hospitable addressing the client by the name and allowing the client to talk about their reason for coming in. The counselor should also not forget welcoming the client in and offering the client a chair to sit and also feel comfortable. In the in-depth exploration stage, here the, can the problem is assessed and the information is gathered regarding the personal, family, and medical history of the client. Then in the goal setting stage, clear goals are set that are connected to the desired end that the client is looking for and are focused on positive growth. For example, if a client was a smoker and he wants to stop smoking, then it means that here the goal setting will be on ways, will be on finding ways the client will set for himself such that he or she stops smoking. And then once the client has stopped smoking, then it means that this is positive growth for the client because remember smoking has very bad 
has very bad effects on health. In the intervention stage, the problem is summarized, a strategy is identified, and an intervention is selected. And then when the intervention is selected, it has to be implemented. The evaluation stage. In the evaluation stage, this is where termination and the referral stage, the counselor assesses the client's progress. He or she determines whether the goals that have been, whether the goals have been achieved and refers them to other services if necessary. That is if goals have not been achieved. Let's look at the importance of assessment in counseling. Remember, we said assessment refers to anything the counselor does to gather information and draw conclusion about concerns of the client. Assessment also helps to make accurate diagnosis and determine whether a person is suitable for certain treatment plan. Assessment also helps the counselor to develop a treatment plan and have better clarification in setting goals and makes the achievement of goals more measurable. Then assessment also helps the counselor to better facilitate the generation of options and also alternatives for the client. In the in-depth exploration stage, information is gathered regarding personal history, family history, medical history, and so on to understand the problem of the client thoroughly. Goal setting in counseling. Goal setting goals help to give direction during is each session. Remember, there could be several sessions the client could have come for. So in each session, a goal is set. This will help in direction, in direct, in the direction during each session. Then clear goals can help motivate the client to take the necessary steps to achieve these goals. Goals should be connected to the desired end that the client is looking for, and these goals should be focused on positive growth. Clients should always be laid, clients should always be laid out in explicit, in explicit and measurable terms. The goals should be attainable and not outside of the knowledge and the skill set of the counselor. Intervention stage in counseling. The intervention stage has three steps. One of it includes summarizing the problem, identifying a strategy and selecting and implementing an intervention. So the problem is summarized using four-dimensional analysis, which include four different components, that is the affective, behavior, cognitive, and interpersonal stroke systematic components. The counselor identifies a strategy that is consistent with the goals and the client's characteristics. The counselor selects and implements an intervention that is best suited for the client and the problem the client are facing. Let's look at psychoanalysis. Sigmund Freud's contribution to psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, and the counseling is enormous. Freud's Psychoanalytic thought was a mainstay of the psychoanalysis during 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. 
Fraud emphasized the importance of unconscious processes in human motivation and his concepts of personality, for example, the id, the ego, and superego. Fraud's theory of analysis of psychoanalysis was the basis for new theories and create for new theories created in the field. Fraud used hypno, hypnosis and the brainer and the brainer's catheteric method initially but later on developed his own concentration techniques. Psychoanalysis. What we mean by psychoanalysis, basically it is a set of theories and the therapeutic techniques that deal that deal on that deal that deal with the unconscious part of the mind, which together form a method of treatment for mental disorders. And hypnosis, hypnosis is a changed state, refers to a changed state of awareness and increased relaxation, and this allows for improved focus and also concentration. And the catacatherosis, this is a concept in psychoanalytic theory where emotions associated with the traumatic events come to surface. Let's look at the drive theory. Fraud's most controversial views concern the importance of innate drives, especially sexuality. Conflicts between the id, ego, and superego result into neurotic, moral, or objective anxiety. Individuals develop ego defense mechanisms to prevent being overwhelmed by strong biological id and forces. Fraud identified the stages of childhood development that can impact later psychopathological or normal developments. So the structure of personality is described by fraud using three components, three components, three concepts, and these three concepts of the mind are the id, ego, and superego. Let's continue with the drives and the instincts. Fraud used the terms drives and the instincts, instincts interchangeably in psychoanalysis, and fraud spoke about two drives. One of them is the self-preservative, and the other is species preservative, in brackets, sexuality. Libido is a psychic energy that emanates from sexual drives. Fraud believed that human motivation was sexual in the broad sense that individuals were motivated to bring themselves pleasure. Fraud put forward, Fraud put forth the idea of death instinct. And the death instinct, which accounted for aggressive drives. For example, some of these aggressive drives include repetition, compulsion, self-destruction, and the compulsion. This is a state of being forced into doing something. Let's look at the levels of consciousness. Fraud gave three levels of consciousness. 
One is the conscious, the conscious, the preconscious or subconscious, and the unconsciousness. Consciousness means consciousness awareness is forms a very small part of the mental of a person's mental life. Then the preconsciousness forms the bridge from the conscious mind to the much larger unconscious. The unconscious is the count is a container which is meant mostly for memories, emotions that are threatening the conscious mind and must be pushed away. Examples of unconscious include hostile or sexual feelings towards a partner and the forgotten childhood, trauma or abuse. All these ones must be pushed away by the mind Let's look at the structure of personality. The ED represents unchecked biological forces, and these biological forces are mostly driven by the pleasure principle. Then the ego is a rational thinking that mediates between the ED and the superego and it deals with the reality following the reality principle. And the superego is the voice of social conscience and it represents parental values. Parental values, these are mostly corrections that have been meant by the pair that have been done by the parent when a child is still growing, and also societal standards, societal standards, for example, the morals that are within that are within the society. Then the ego, the ego, the, the ego ideal is formed when the child incorporates the parents' values, whereas the conscience refers to behaviors disapproved by the parents. Behaviors dis disapproved by the parents, for example, if a child is behaving in a bad way, usually the parents will disapprove the behavior by telling the child not to repeat such a behavior. The superego is non-rational, seeking perfection and adherence to an ideal, inhib inhibiting both the id and the ego and controlling both psychological drives, that is the id and the realistic, striving for perfection, that is the ego. Let's look at the psychosexual stages of development. The development of id, ego, superego, and the ego defense mechanisms, these are based on psychosexual development in the first five years of life. The psychosexual theories are based on biological drives and the pleasure principle, where certain parts of the body are, signif are a significant focus of pleasure during different periods of development. The psychopathology Psychopathology can result due to imbalances between id, ego, and the superego, repressed or suppressed issues, excessive use of defensive mechanisms, fixation in psychosexual stages, or conflicted, maladaptive, or inadequate child parent relationships. Fraud's psychosexual stages of development include oral, anal, phallic, latency, and genital. Let's look at the role of a counselor, roles of counselors in psychoanalytic, in psychoanalytical therapy.
One of the roles of a counselor in psychoanalytical therapy is to encourage the client to talk about whatever comes to their mind, especially childhood experiences. Remember, we said that uh, some of the childhood experiences may still be lingering around in the client's mind. That is why counselors are encouraged to request the client to talk about what comes in their mind with regard to childhood experiences. Another role of a counselor is to make it easy for clients to experience to express their thoughts that can be difficult to express by getting them comfortable. For example, the counselor can provide the client with a coach to lie on or a chair to sit or a chair to sit behind them. This helps them with the free association, with the free association process. Counselors also should enable clients to gain insight by, re by, by, relieving, by, re by relieving and working through the unresolved past experiences that come to the forefront during the, the sessions. In other words, when a client is communicating about their past experiences, the counselor should encourage them more to talk and they talk about their past experiences. Because as they talk more and more about their past experiences, this brings relief to the client. So this therapy encourages the counselor to interpret material for the client. The counselor's role is also to help the client connect the dots between their past experience and current problems. Maybe the past experiences and the current, prob uh, current problems are the ones that could have brought about the problem with the client. Let's look at the goals of psychoanalytical therapy. One of the goals of psychoanalytical therapy is that the goals of any psychotherapy vary as per client. However, psychoanalytical therapy focuses mostly on personal adjustment, inducing a re inducing a reorganization of internal forces within the person. When the clients talk about their past and their present, this will bring about reorganization in the person or in the client. The primary goal is to help the client become more aware of the unconscious aspects of their personality and work through current reactions that may be dysfunctional. The next goal is to help the client work through a developmental stage not previously resolved. Remember we said that during childhood, during childhood, according to Freud's psychoanalysis theory, there are certain stages in childhood that need to be resolved and there are others that were not resolved. So if, this, they, if there are certain stages that were not resolved properly, then this would appear later when the person grows up as an adult. So the next goal is to help the client work through a developmental stage not previously resolved, and also becoming unstuck and living more productively. Finally, the other goal of psychoanalytical theory is to help clients cope with the demands of the society in which they live by focusing on environmental adjustment 
especially in areas of work and intimacy, strengthening the ego so that perceptions and plans become more realistic. Let's look at techniques used in psychoanalytical therapy. One of the techniques is free association. In free association, the, this is where the client abandons the normal way of consuring thoughts and they says whatever comes to their mind, even if the thoughts seem silly, irrational, suggestive, or painful. Then the other technique is the dream analysis. In the dream analysis, this is where clients are encouraged to dream and remember their dreams. And the, anal the analyst interprets both the manifest content and the latent content of the dream. The third one is analysis of transference. This is where the this is where client's response to the counselor is encouraged and also interpreted, reflecting the client's relationship with a significant figure in their past. Maybe this significant figure was their parents, maybe the caretaker, or maybe their friends. Usually, the parent figure is more significant. Then analysis of resistance. This is where resistance to other therapeutic processes is analyzed and also interpreted to help the client gain insight into, insight into their behavior. Then interpretation. This is where the counselor helps the client to understand the meaning of their past experiences and the present personal events by explaining and analyzing their thoughts, feelings, and actions. Let's look at the strength, the strength of psychoanalysis. The approach emphasizes the importance of sexuality and the unconscious the unconscious in human behavior, and the approach leads itself to empirical studies and has generated a tremendous amount of research. The psychoanalysis approach also provides a theoretical basis of support for a number of diagnostic instruments, such as the TAT or the TAT and research ink blood test. TAT, T-A-T, this is stands for, this is stands for thematic appreciation test. It stands for a thematic appreciation test and this test was created in 1930s by Henry and Christina and this test was created to understand to understand a person's subconsciousness and the motives in relation to achievements power and also intimacy Then we have the Rosax Ink Blood Test. Rosax Ink Blood Test. This is a projective test. This is a projective psychological test in which subjects' perception of ink bloods are recorded and then analyzed using psychological test and this test was designed to look for patterns of thought disorders 
in patients who are suffering from schizophrenia. And it also includes other areas like personality, emotional disorders, and also intelligence. So in this test, the subjects, the subjects are supposed to look are supposed to look at the cards one at a time and they are to describe what each ink blot resembles in the card. Then they are instructed to look at the shape, the shading and the color of the ink blots after which the subject uh, after that the subjects after all the subjects have viewed all the 10 cards the examiner goes back over the responses from the subjects for more information psychoanalysis continues to involve it to evolve and the contemporary psychoanalytic theorists have integrated new findings and modernized the approach. The psychoanalytic analytic approach has influenced other psychological approaches, such as attachment theory, object relations theory, and self-psychology. Let's look at social interest. So, so, social interest evolves in three stages. Aptitude, ability, and the secondary dynamic characteristics. Adela believed that the parent-child relationship was highly instrumental in developing social trust. The mother-child bond is the earliest and the most significant relationship in the development of social interest. Mostly children, when they are still young, as they stay with their mother, they develop their social interest. Whereas the father-child relationship is also very important, and the father should have favorable attitudes towards his family, occupation, and also social institutions. When the child looks at this, He will also grow up having copying the attitudes of the father. So if a person has little social interest, then the person is self-centered and he tends to put down others and he lacks constructive goals. Let's look at inferiority and superiority. Adela suggested that individuals try to overcome physical inferiorities by psychological adjustments. Feelings of inferiority were the, were, were the motivation to achieve and attain, and attain in life. Psychological disabilities, pampering, and the neglect may threaten the development of self-confidence and also social interest. As you remember in childhood or as parents, remember there are some parents who pamper their children a lot and some who neglect them and once this happens to a child, then it means that this child this will threaten the development of self-confidence and also 
social interest in the long run in the future. Some inferiority complexes and the superiority com com complexes are not normal. So striving for superiority or competence is a natural and fundamental motivation of individuals. Let's look at birth order. Birth order could have an impact on how a child relates to society and development of their life, of their style of life. For example, the oldest children may be initially spoiled and later dethroned, leading them to become bossy, strict, and also authoritative. Then the second born children, these always have an older rival and this makes them more, this makes them competitive because they are competing with the other child of, they are competing with the firstborn. Then the middle children may be independent and ambitious. Then the youngest children may be dependent and have a strong desire to be liked. This is what applies mostly with the children who are born, who are the last borns. Most of the times they want to be loved. Then only children, the only children may feel the pleasure of their parents' expectations and may be self-centered. Let's look at the techniques of Alderian therapy. One, one of the techniques is confrontation. Challenges clients to change their private logic to recognize behavior changes. Asking the questions, asking the question. Counselors ask clients, what would be different if you were well? And this is being asked to promote change. These questions are being asked by the client, by the counselor, such that this will promote change in the client. The other technique is encouragement. Encouragement implies faith in a person and also promotes healthy lifestyle and also learning. As you very well know, when an individual is encouraged, he will have the interest in learning. But if you discourage an individual, he will not learn. The other third technique is acting as if. Clients act as if. As if they are ideal people. So when clients act as if they are ideal people, of course this will encourage the clients to change and behave in a better way. Then the other technique is spitting into the client's soup. This technique of spitting into the client's soup points out certain behaviors and it removes, points out certain behaviors and it removes the reward for them. Let me explain more on spitting into the soup. Spitting into the soup is a memorable me metaphor and it reminds us that sometimes it is necessary to spoil the fun in order to alter negative patterns and also create positive change. Another technique is catching one's self. Clients become aware of their self-destructive thoughts and also behaviors. So when they become aware of their destructive thoughts and behaviors, then they will notice that this is very bad. Then eventually they will leave. They will leave the destructive behavior 
and also the destructive thoughts. The other technique is task setting. Task setting, this sets the short-term goals that work up to long-term objectives. And these long-term, these short-term goals mostly are being set by the client. And when these short-term goals are set up by the client, then eventually they will work up on two long-term objectives. The other technique is the push button technique. The push button technique, this encourages clients to choose the stimuli in their lives and create their own feelings. For example, in this technique or with the push button technique, clients are encouraged to have choices in stimuli in their lives that they should pay attention to. And when they pay attention to these choices, then it means that this will create feelings of concentrating on their thoughts. For example, remembering positive or negative experiences. Thank you for listening and have a nice evening. Thank you.